And welcome to Thursday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com, as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dottino. I'm Lance Meadow. With you for the next 60 minutes, it is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. Multiple ways for you to interact with us here on the program. You give us a ring, 201-939-4513. You can also hide behind the computer screen and use hashtag <laughs> Giants Chat. We have a jam-packed show. If there is another college out there that has a prospect to offer the NFL, I don't know if it exists after we get through these next 60 minutes because we're going to try to squeeze in as many Division I programs as humanly possible. And the first stop on our journey takes us to the Missouri Tigers. And to break down a few of their prospects, we bring in Chris Gervino, their radio play-by-play announcer. Chris, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dettino here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Greatly appreciate the time this afternoon. Hope all is well as everything on your end. Yes, sir. My pleasure. Things are good. Good to be with you guys. Absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure having you on the program. And let's start with the top prospect out of Missouri. That, of course, is defensive lineman Darius Robinson. Has great length. That, I think, is the first thing that jumps out, as well as his power. He's had experience, Chris, on the inside as well as the outside. So where do you see his best fit and whether or not that sack production can carry over to the NFL? Right. I I think most people are looking about him. Certainly the talk about him is uh, on the edge at defensive end. That's where he really finished up his Missouri career. But you're correct. He played a lot inside earlier in his career, moved out to the edge this past season and just had a terrific year. I mean, he's got great size and length, 6'5", 295, was a captain of the team, really does does everything well, just a great representative for the the program and was, uh, you know, the guy you really want out front. Uh, of your football team, both physically <laughs> and then just as a as an ambassador talking about the team and the program. But I would guess, especially with the premium on pass rushing uh, in, in the NFL, that, that, that he probably will, uh, you know, portray as a defensive end. But he's got the ability to play inside. But he, he would be certainly the, uh, the, the top candidate, probably he and Ennis Rakestraw, the defensive back, I'm sure he'll Ask me about as well, probably. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I thought his strength was really impressive because you know he's not a three hundred pounder; he's he's a little less than that at about two eighty five. But I thought he was he was extra strong for his size, and that kind of stood out to me. And I think that will translate well as he comes to the next level. Well, I tell you, you know, at this level, a uh, major college, and certainly in the SEC, and obviously in the NFL, all these guys are incredible athletes: size, strength, speed. But this guy, I mean, is the poster guy, certainly for Missouri. I mean, there is not an ounce of fat on him. He is strong. And he, uh, I mean, I mean, really. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm around these guys all the time. I've been doing this for 30-plus years. And he is as good-looking of an athlete in terms of size, strength. Again, that word, length. Uh, he, he's just a tremendous competition. There aren't many guys, again, after all these years, you kind of do a double-take and almost gawk at and this guy, I've told people I want to be Darius Robinson when I uh, come back from my next life. <laughs> uh, he, he is a great, great-looking athlete and, again, really a good guy. So whoever gets him is going to really, I think, be pleased with, with him on and off the field in so many ways. Darius, uh, in terms of, uh, Chris, his ability to stop the run, what jumps out to you there? Because we always talk about these guys who are great athletes off the edge getting after the quarterback, but where does he fit into profile-wise in terms of helping Missouri slow down the ground attack and whether or not that could be some facet of his game on the NFL level? Right. You know, that will really remain to be seen, but he does have that experience. He played inside again as he was coming up uh, through the ranks here at Mizzou the first few years. He was a defensive tackle, but defensive end – element uh, really came late in his career and it really blossomed out there again but but he's a guy who was a legitimate player in the rotation in previous years they would rotate you know uh two tackles at each spot and he was very much in the mix of those three or four guys and then there was just a need really to get someone outside and, and he certainly filled that need and then some was just terrific so i do think he's got the versatility again I would guess he's going to be an end uh, initially in the NFL. I think that's where most people are looking at him. But but he does have that experience, and I think you know more so than many, he would uh, have the ability to slide inside if necessary, and maybe some teams actually see him that way. But, but again, I would guess, based on how he finished his career here and the projections I've seen, that he's probably going to stay outside for the most part. You have two defensive backs, corners in particular, who are going to be uh, much in that mix uh, of the very highly thought of 
cornerback draft class this year. Uh, I think that Rake Straw will, will go first before uh, Abrams Drain or Drani. I'm not sure exactly how he likes to pronounce it, so I'll defer to you there. But could you give me a, a, a kind of a thumbnail sketch on what you like about both and what you think's different about either one and why one team might prefer one over the other? Right. Well, they were both really good. I mean, again, having been here a long time, that, that this was maybe the best set of cornerbacks Missouri has ever had. And, you know, they certainly have had some difficult years over the many years, but, you know, they've been, been better as well at times, too. Uh, and I think this tandem was the best they had, and that showed uh, Missouri really held its own and then some in the SEC this year against some good teams with really good wide receivers, many of whose names will be called early in the upcoming draft in a few weeks. But I think Rake Straw does go a little earlier. He's a little bigger. They both stand about 5'11". Uh, Rake Straw a little more uh, strength, uh, about 185 probably last numbers I saw. And uh, But but he, this kid, he just sticks his nose in there, and he is tough. I mean, he, he will tackle. He will come up. He's good against the run, good against the pass. He just kept getting better and better. He was a very highly recruited player. Uh, out of Texas and actually chose Missouri over Alabama in the end. And I mean, a lot of guys list a lot of schools or a lot of schools list a lot of the other schools that they quote unquote beat out for him, but that was legit. And it was a late decision and he chose Missouri and uh, he lived up to the billing. I mean, he was just a really good cover guy. And again, just a, a sure tackler from that spot. You don't always see corners as great tacklers, but you better mm-hmm. be the NFL. So I think he'll go first. A uh, Chris Abrams drain KAD as they call him, obviously uh, here at Mizzou quite a bit. Also pretty good, but he's really undersized. I mean, he's been listed at, at 180, 178. I mean, he is he is a, a thin, lean, lanky kid. Uh, you know, I, I think folks would like him to be a little bigger if they could. Uh, he, outstanding, though, in coverage. Again, very quick, had very mm-hmm. good games and results against some of the SEC's best. Uh, he's a return man, too, at least at the collegiate level. He's very good for Missouri, returning uh, kicks and, and some punts at times. So he does have that uh, in his repertoire as well. But I think... You know, they're both uh, uh, draftable players, but I think Rakestraw certainly would go uh, earlier, and I think Rakestraw goes probably pretty early in the draft. Real quick, I think Chris, if I read correctly, had originally come in as a wide receiver and then transferred over to the defensive side. And, you know, I think because of his diminutive size, and he has terrific quicks, I love his quicks and his ability to mirror in in the short range. I think he's going to be a really good slot guy in the NFL, no? Well, he sure could be. He sure could be. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, four, four, forty. He can fly. And you're right. You're right on. Came as a receiver, and they uh, switched him over to DBs because they were so thin at that spot a few years ago. And I mean, he didn't miss a beat. He became one of the SEC's best. So with Chris Abrams' drain, you'd say versatility, I and mean, he can do a lot of things. And with that speed, uh, somebody's going to give him a good long look. That's for sure. Yeah, big reason why he had 27 passes defensed in the last two seasons. So that certainly jumps out. I want to go back to Rake Straw, Chris, because he tore his ACL in 2021, and I know he missed a few games this past season with a groin injury. How concerning are the durability issues that have popped up over the last few seasons? Well, he does have that history, unfortunately, where he's had a couple of injuries. But, you know, I will say each time he came back and uh, – you know, did not miss much time. I mean, he's, he's just a tough kid. I mean, again, you look at him, you know, especially with the pads off, uh, you think, okay, he's a football player, but you don't – he changes when he's on the field. I mean, he gets out there and he sticks his nose in there and makes some plays. I mean, he made some great, great individual plays. You look at a lot of tape, like I'm sure you guys probably have or will or many of the draft people do of, of these individuals. And some of his games against some big-time teams – uh, he was not bashful. He would get in there. And what, what stood out to me about Ennis Rakestraw, not just his coverage, but, again, his tackling ability, and I think that really uh, w- was more noticeable with him than many other good defensive backs I've, I've seen certainly here and around the SEC. Uh, let's talk briefly about another guy who's got some length and some power, and that's your left tackle, Javon Foster. Uh, they they uh, got him at the combine at 6'5", 319, pretty good measurables. And uh, I, I think he probably is going to wind up being a tackle. I don't, I don't think you're going to move him inside when you get him to the NFL. I think he's got the skills to play tackle. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I've seen some people, again, project him as left guard uh, possibly. But I think he's tackle. That's certainly where he was here. I mean, he was a mainstay, a fixture there, left tackle from Missouri the last couple of years. And you're right on with the numbers. He was about 6'5", 315. And, and, I mean, just a big, solid guy when he played. And 
I mean, this guy was hardly ever penalized. I mean, minimally uh, at that left tackle position, guarding the blind side of the quarterback in Missouri, of course, threw the ball uh, quite a bit these last couple of years. But Missouri would so often run left, and I think most people knew it, and, and they still had trouble stopping uh, <laughs> uh, but because fixed, uh, really it was not, uh, you know, a surprise. And, and we all knew it announcing the games, and people on the other side would know it, but they were very consistent, very productive behind Javon Foster at left tackle. Another kid, Xavier Delgado, was a left guard, and those two guys were fixtures there on the left side of the line for, for Missouri. So those are, are two big people they need to replace. But Foster's just a good, solid player, and I think he'll be drafted uh, probably early to middle rounds, maybe th- rounds three or four. And I just think uh, I, I wouldn't count him out. I think he'll be a, a mainstay for a team. I, I don't know that he goes in and starts right away, but with his work ethic and reputation – I mean, there's no coincidence Missouri was able to win 11 games in the Cotton Bowl last year. They've got probably six, seven guys who could get drafted this year, and that mm-hmm. is a load, you know, especially for us here. And, Chris, from what I understand, I mean, he played right tackle and left tackle. So if he does stay a tackle, there's versatility where a team could very well line him up on either side. Did you see a difference in play on the right side versus the left side? How consistent was he throughout the course of his career? Well, Right, he was a right tackle earlier, and I think they liked his productivity there. And again, when that spot opened a couple of years ago, he was the best candidate to move over. And then, the, really, he was a mainstay at left tackle. That was where he started and really stayed uh, throughout the last couple of seasons. But but he does have right tackle in his history. He could play uh, there as well. Missouri's big need was at left tackle, and they, I mean, they put him in there and and just never moved. I mean, he was just so consistent and so good i think you know we've gone in the right order really of the draftees certainly robinson rake straw i'm interested to see where abrams drain goes but but uh, foster will certainly be drafted i think those are the you know the top three or four guys certainly because of his just consistency and uh, just repetition there productive uh, productive nature there at that left tackle spot especially i got one more guy for you and that would be uh, cody schrader the running back who doesn't have any eye-opening traits in terms of his physical skill set or his testing numbers, but when you watch him play, he's just a football player. He sweats, he bleeds, he's a blue-collar guy, he will battle you and fight you. I think he'd bite your ear off if he could. Uh, <laughs> I mean, am I am I off base when I, when I talk about him like that? Nope, I wouldn't bet against him. I would not bet against him. And again, when he showed up here, even I had to say, now, who's this? And I've done this a long time at this school in my job. And uh, he came out of St. Louis, and Truman stayed up in little Kirksville, Missouri, up by the Iowa border. And this kid was unbelievable. The ultimate competitor, all he did was lead the SEC. The SEC in rushing mm-hmm. was, of course, one of the three finalists for the Doak Walker Award, won the National Burlesworth Trophy for, you know, most productive uh, player who started as a walk-on for his team. I mean, I would not bet against him. Everybody will. I mean, his speed's like four six, and little diminutive guy five nine. I mean, I mean, he just doesn't necessarily look the part. But trust me, because I learned, uh, much to my surprise, he can play. And and people say, which is true, and I get it. Uh, at least special teams, and certainly I think very much so that. But I would also add, and then some. I just uh, bear against him at your own risk. I would suggest he'll be drafted probably later. <laughs> But somebody's going to draft this kid, and I'm not sure they're going to regret it by any means. I'm with you. Well, if he bites ears and not kneecaps, I don't know if he'll fit into the Lions style, but maybe another team in the NFL will clearly be interested uh, right. in his services. Yes, he is Chris Gervito, radio play-by-play announcer for the Missouri Tigers. Chris, can't thank you enough. Greatly appreciate the time and the inside, and look forward to talking down the road. Thanks be for well. coming on. Thank you. Guys, thanks a lot, and say hello to Drew Locke for me. I hope he really finds his footing with the Giants. That would be great. He's a great kid. Absolutely. Veteran quarterback to back up yeah. the rest of the depth chart, no doubt about it. And we appreciate the time again, Chris, and we'll definitely pass along your good graces to Drew Locke, who is now the newest member of that quarterback depth chart. But from Missouri, we now transfer over to BYU, as they have a notable offensive lineman atop their prospect list. And we bring in former BYU defensive back Benjamin Criddle, who you could hear on ESPN Radio 960 in Utah. Benjamin, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dottino here on Big Blue Kickoff Live on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? 
Uh, awesome, man. Beautiful weather here in Utah. Enjoying it. Finally getting out into the sun. So spring is here. Very excited. <laughs> well, we're dealing with a little bit of rain here in the New York City, New Jersey area, but we could certainly relate to the sun as spring is nearing as well. And appreciate you hopping on. So let's start with their top prospect, and that is on the offensive line. And I have been practicing and enunciating in the mirror over the last <laughs> few days. His first name is Kingsley. That's the easy part. The last name is Suamataia, and I heard it right out of his mouth. So if that is wrong, then something is wrong then with his enunciation, Benjamin. But in all seriousness, has experience at left tackle and right tackle, started at Oregon, transferred to BYU. So he's got two years of starting experience that you saw up close and personal. He looks the part. He's got the frame. He has the length. So where do you see him now fitting in on the NFL level in terms of that part that the optics we see on the college level transferring over to the NFL? Yeah, so in length, as far as his length is concerned, his footwork, his athleticism, he can play tackle. He can definitely play tackle. But the great thing about him is he's physical enough and nasty enough. Um, you got to maybe sometimes coax it out of him because he comes from a fantastic family. He's a fantastic kid. Um really uh, a family first mindset for him and that's why he came you know back from from Oregon to to Provo and Orem and came back to BYU and became somewhat of a hometown hero because he hey he wanted to be around family so um it, you know I think that that family mindset is uh, is a good thing and uh, so whoever brings him in and treats him as family he's going to embrace them as family but he's a nasty dude he can be very nasty so you know I look at that interior guard uh you know and i don't know what your needs are specifically but you could put him at left guard you put him at right guard he works well with you know as far as communication with his uh his teammates uh in those trenches and so uh you can put him at any one of those spots uh so the ability to play left tackle right tackle left guard right guard i think is uh is extremely valuable when you're talking about a first or second day pick which he Talent-wise and even grade-wise, productivity-wise, he he merits first and second day looks from from every organization that's looking to uh, backfill a position, maybe try to uh, fill some gaps uh, along that offensive line room. So that, that that's what I would say. I mean, that the versatility is really on point. He's been he's been reared to do this. Like he's been fed, uh, coached. He came out of the womb to be an <laughs> offensive lineman at the NFL level. His dad, Leroy, has been extremely hands-on. Uh, I remember, you know, seeing videos of Kingsley. I got to know Kingsley locally, like when he was in his in his early teens. When, uh, you know, we we knew he could be really good, extremely athletic, played basketball, was boxing, and in the hand-to-hand combat and things like that. Leroy really tried to diversify his skill set. And uh, so you, you'll, you're going to see that when you size him up, when you get kind of uh, your eyes on him and you get to see him moving out there on the field if the Giants were to take him. So um, just versatile, uh, great skill set. But foundationally, you're, you're getting a lot to work with. I always talk about good clay. And Artisan loves good clay. And so, uh, you know, what do those coaches feel like they can do with that good clay is the question. What intrigues me, and I know he was an invite to the Senior Bowl, he had another year of eligibility left, right? How much better could he have been had he honed in and stayed for another year and maybe worked on one of those positions as opposed to all of the various versatility kind of skills that he showed? Yeah, there's a lot of components in, like, making that jump, right? I think uh, there's family components, family dynamics. You know, maybe he wants to go and take care of his family. Now and NIL yeah. definitely aids and supports in that, but like he, he may want to get out there and make a lot of money and and you know give back to the family that has given him so much and so many opportunities. So I think that's a that's a component. So when you have that sense of urgency, it, it changes everything. And um, so I think I think there's there's multiple facets. I, I think that there's the, the, what you're saying is 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 valid if we had continuity of coaching staff along that offensive okay. line. We've had multiple offensive line coaches at BYU over the last, you know, six, seven years. I mean, we had Ryan Pugh who came in with Jeff Grimes, phenomenal coaches, and then 
Jeff Grimes, and then uh, Eric Mateos. Uh, and then he went to Baylor and now is at Arkansas. Uh, you know, and so you only got one or two years of those guys. Kingsley came in, you know, after COVID and got Coach Funk. And Coach Funk is was a, a guy that had bounced around a lot, was at Michigan with Ridge Rod, and, and uh, he was at San Diego State, I think, under Hoke. And good, good coach, I mean, but he was in the twilight of his career, and I think – you do need a little bit of new blood. And so he's sitting there thinking, trying to figure out, okay, do I come back? Is Funk coming back? Is there a new coach coming in? Mm. TJ Woods comes in at BYU. It's like, well, I don't know TJ, but I think he's a good coach. But if I invest all my time and effort and focus into becoming a professional, what's my best return on investment? I want to go get coached by the best. And the idea is that the best coaches are in the National Football League where I can spend – you know, 24-7, 365, focusing and honing my craft, I'm going to get the best return on investment now jumping to the league. Um, he, they, he knew he was going to test out well. I mean, he's been clocked, I think, on GPS at like 21 miles per hour, 22 mm -hmm. miles per hour. I don't know what his peak speed was at the combine. I'd have to pull that up. But you're, you're talking about a galloping gazelle. You know, I mean, he can run, um, and, and he's nimble and quick. And like I said, like, I don't even know if he's reached his athletic potential quite honestly. Like, I think there's still, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20% more athleticism to, to extract out of his body. Benjamin, you brought up his family, how his father looked to diversify his talent. For our audience to understand, he's cousins of Panay Sewell, who's one of the best offensive yeah. linemen in the game for the Detroit Lions. I'm curious because you said you know Kingsley going back to his teens. How much did he work out at all with Panay? And how much has Panay maybe groomed him, even if it's now to this day during the offseason when Panay's not in Detroit working out with the Lions at all? All the time. Every time Panay came back and was <laughs> in the Utah area training, like I would see them at Orem, you know, working kick step, working hand play, Smart you know, man. working punch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, like I said, like family, 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 right? This, this is a very tight knit family. And so, um, it's uh, it's something that that he should have tapped into. And I'm sure, you know, Penny was was is going to continue to mentor him through this process too. I mean, Penny's been in the league now for a few years and one of the best tackles in the league. And so, um, there's going to be mentorship throughout that entire process because I do think Kingsley keeps a pretty tight knit circle. So you know, his mentorship um, doesn't extend out to you know you know all networks. But uh, Penny's a fantastic resource, so 100% going to be involved. All right, let's uh, quickly get a thumbnail sketch, if we can, on the uh, the two-time transfer who wound up at BYU at quarterback Slovis because he was at USC, then he was at Pitt, and we know that sure. you know when you bounce around like that, that can be a benefit or it can be a detriment. Uh, from yeah. where he from where he finally finished up at BYU. How did you see his development, and where do you think his ceiling might be as someone who's going to be a back end of the draft, potentially a, a project more than a prospect? Yeah, as in all things, I mean, I think the truth of his story uh, always needs to be investigated. Why did he transfer? You know, what injuries did he sustain? You know, why, there, why, why was there a drop in production? These are all things that we talked about on our show and evaluated and and then you, you you take all that in, and then you 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 size him up. You you watch him throw. You watch him go through his progressions. You watch him uh, lead and communicate, and see how much he can assimilate into a new new program, new schematics, new playbook, um, new culture, uh, new coaching staff. All those things, and I really do think it's more of a positive. Like you're not going to find. I don't. I mean, I'd have to look at the top ten quarterbacks in this class. I don't think any of them have learned three offensive systems and been productive. Uh, we're talking 11,000 yards through the air, almost 100 touchdowns through the air. Uh, his, his, his TD to INT ratio is solid. He runs a 4 5, five 40. He throws a 57-mile-an-hour pigskin fastball. When he, when he puts it, you know, when he does his off-speed, he can, he can moderate his off-speed a little bit. He may have to work on a little bit more of that elasticity you know, from where he came from, because he wasn't a multi-sport athlete necessarily. Like, he ended up being more of an arm thrower early on, and because he got high volume with Graham Harrell at USC, kind of overtrained, overthrew, and then injured the throwing shoulder. So that's that could also have led to some of that 
that decrease in productivity as he was changing his mechanics and becoming more of a lower half torso torque thrower and just letting the arm come through, right? Um, and that's what 3D QB does there out of um, out of Southern California and all, all the, some of the best guys in the country over the last decade have been training there to improve their mechanics, right. to improve their longevity, um, to have science a science science based approach in their in their mechanics. And so, you know, I I like Keaton a lot. I think he, if you interact with him, you're going to come away impressed with football IQ. He's going to interview well. He's extremely intelligent. So one of the biggest issues with some of these big arm talents is like how do they how do they do, how do they read, retain, and execute? Right, mm-hmm. read, retain, apply. Mm-hmm. And because these the, the verbiage is so elongated, it can be very complicated. So you know what's his memory like? Uh, the Wonder League does a decent job. There's other tests out there that that can gauge football IQ, but uh, I think all of those things combined, it's like okay, like. How many quarterbacks in this draft class have that robust of a resume with productivity at three different schools? Um, yeah, he's had a few injury issues here or there. Um, and I think a lot of these quarterbacks coming out of this year's draft class have had injuries or, you know, they were transfers and they're trying to look for an opportunity to, but to find the right fit. So I think you can put a, 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 a you know, a, a red flag on those guys too, if that's the case. But if, if he was entitled, in transferring, then I'd say it's a red flag. I don't like entitlement. I don't think any coach, I don't think any organization, unless you're like the, the, the best talent in the world and you can just be entitled and you produce, nobody wants, you know, uh, an entitled individual in their program, in their organization, uh, because it just undermines culture, man. It subterfuges everything. It's a poison, right? Like, you don't want that at all. And this kid is not entitled. I've been around entitled kids. Like, I know exactly what they look like, what they say, how they operate. Keaton's not a an entitled individual. So I view Keaton as a steal late or as a high-priority undrafted free agent that can make possibly a 53-man if you want to keep three quarterbacks, if that's what you're, you're, you're down with, which, you know, some do, some don't. Uh, I, I think everybody would want this kid as a practice squad guy on their roster. Like, he's a good locker room kid. Like, he is. And he's a competitor. He's a grinder. He puts in work. So, like, once again, going to that entitlement element, it's like the entitled kid doesn't work. Keaton works, man. So if there's any question marks about any of these quarterbacks that these uh, GMs and, and scouts and coaches are evaluating, it's like, well, we don't want the entitled kid. We want the kid that's going to come in and work his tail off that is going to be coachable. Um, we want blue-collar kids. I mean, that's football is blue-collar. I don't care what anybody says. It's still blue-collar. And we want a meritocracy. We want kids to earn it. We want – these uh, these individuals to, to hone their craft. Um, if I'm a coach, if I'm a GM, if I'm a scout, that's what we want. So Keaton's, Keaton's a late late round draft pick um, for me. Um, but I mean, you're in a four five five, dude. I, I mean, that's sick. <laughs> uh, sure. yeah. Guys, guys, he's six three two thirty. Okay, that's a big body. That's a massive. That's a massive human being. It really is. He can take hits too. He's durable. I know he's had injuries, but like. Go back and watch one of the things, the Texas game. Like, we sucked. I mean, we were not good on the offensive line. And part of that was due to transfer portal. We had a ton of talent. But the transfer portal is a unique dynamic right now, and it's hard to get the the most important position, in my opinion, on the football field all aligned, working in cohesion with proper culture when you have – Five transfer portal guys. Your two deep is comprised of 70% transfer portal guys. But that's hard. And Keaton had to work with that. That's not easy, right? That's not an easy thing. So, But he, he ended up – there was a sack strip fumble, okay? On his release, you know, the arm was hit, and it ended up being a fumble. Or, you know, it was called a fumble. And something that speaks to his character – now, this is a business decision sometimes for quarterbacks. Um, a lot of guys will say, like, Tom Brady ain't going to go after that football not going to go after that football not late in his career but i do think be a quarterback at the collegiate level go after that football and keaton sprinted and dove and injured himself in doing such going for the football that's a football play yeah sure john Gruden, i get it it's a football play i get right? it so, anyway, i get it anyway. yeah 
No, 100%. Benjamin Criddle, former BYU defensive back. You can hear him on ESPN Radio 960 in Utah, giving us the latest of a few of the BYU prospects. Benjamin, greatly appreciate the time of the insight. Look forward to talking to you down the road. Thanks so much. Good one. Thanks, Thank Mike. you. Hey, you got it. Absolutely. Our pleasure. So, from BYU, let's now head a little bit closer to the East Coast as we arrive at South Carolina. Just a little bit. Just a tad. Yes, just a tad <laughs> as we continue to take our journey across the United States, putting all of these D1 programs under the microscope. We bring in Wes Mitchell, who covers South Carolina football for GamecockCentral.com. Wes, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dettino here on Giants.com. Big Blue Kickoff Live. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Yeah, we're good, guys. Uh, going through spring practice here, and obviously excited to see where some of these South Carolina prospects uh, end up uh, coming up in the draft. And I uh, hope y'all are good, too, man. Absolutely. Well, let's start with wide receiver Xavier Leggett. I think what's interesting about him is he didn't have a season, Wes, where he had more than 30 targets until last year. Prior to that, you didn't really get an idea of what he could do with a bigger workload and so forth. So have we seen him just start scratching the ceiling? How would you best put into perspective what 2023 showed us with respect to his skill set? Yeah, you know, guys, this is a kid that we were always hearing during his time at South Carolina. Uh, kind of reports about how big he is, how fast he is, and just, uh, you know, frankly, compared to the college guys, like, this kid is a physical freak, and uh, – you saw that in some of the testing numbers from the Combine. And uh, just his final year here at South Carolina, he finally kind of just put it all together. Early on, you know, he was kind of making a little bit of a transition back to the receiver position. He played quarterback his senior year in high school. That staff kind of just went the route of, hey, let's put our best athlete at quarterback and snap him the ball every time and let him make something happen. And so, you know, he was playing behind some older guys. Like I said, didn't necessarily put it all together. And I, I think if you look at his the end of his junior year, he had some big plays on special teams as the kickoff returner, made some big plays in South Carolina's bowl game as a receiver, and, and really just kind of catapulted that as his confidence went up. He used that as a springboard into his final year. They had a new offense coordinator, so it was kind of a, a fresh, clean slate for him. And uh, he, he just took off from there and, and took full advantage he is kind of a uh, first-in-the-door, last-to-leave type worker, and, and it just all kind of fell into place for him. When you when you talk to him and when you watch him play, do you see enough of the high-level, consistent effort on plays, even when he's not supposed to get the ball and when he's trying to block for the run? Or do you, do you see a guy who may sometimes be a little disinterested? No, I, I don't think you got to worry about the disinterest at all with, it, with him. This, this, is, this is a guy who as South Carolina's primary receiver, was also playing on special teams as a kickoff returner, was also playing on special teams as a gunner on punt coverage. Mm -hmm. I mean, flying down the field uh, with, with bad intentions to, to take somebody out on the other end. So, uh, like I said, um, you know, it, it was kind of one of those things, guys, where all this past offseason, we would be talking about maybe some other receivers. Juice Wells was their top returning receiver. And consistently, the coaching staff kept saying, well, guys, Leggett's had a great offseason. Leggett's had a great offseason. Mm. And we, may, we maybe didn't listen enough. And, uh, and just from, from moment one against North Carolina this past year, that was who they opened the season with. He emerged as just the primary top receiver. Um, I, I don't think you ever got to worry about effort with this dude. He can play inside in the slot. He can play outside, which is, I think is more uh, akin to his maybe skill set. He can catch the football for you down the field, jump ball situations. He can do run after the catch. Uh, really just, I think, has, even though it's only the one year, that, that maybe will concern some NFL teams, but he really blossomed into a complete receiver. Speaking of his pathway that you just referenced, I'm wondering, Wes, because a lot of the commentary about Xavier is once the ball gets up in the air, Look out. I mean, this guy, to your point, the effort is there. He'll make the big plays. He'll even bail out the quarterback. But getting the route 
and getting down the field is at times unconventional. It's not the most smoothest. Would you say that that's a fair synopsis of his game? And how maybe is that still a product of, at the end of the day, there's that rawness to him? Because as we're talking about, we really only have one complete season to acknowledge what he could do at this stage. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think he is still a little bit raw as a receiver, to your point. And, and some of that, guys, is just uh, his frame is so big. He, he's not – when you see him in person, you, like, realize this guy is not built like your typical wide receiver. Now, now there are a few guys that have made it to the league that, you know, may, maybe would compare to him. But when, when you see him in person, he almost looks like a linebacker. So, it, it's not always going to look quite as smooth as maybe some of the other guys at that position – in terms of route running and, and changing his, you know, kind of flipping his hips and stuff like that. But I, I was impressed also just with his ability after the catch. So, so like I said, he can, he can go get the jump ball down the field, but they used him underneath. I, I mean, if you go back and watch South Carolina's win over Mississippi State, there's a play that the video went kind of viral on social media where he just catches like a basic underneath kind of shallow cross drag route and outruns the entire Mississippi State defense uh, – to the end zone it was kind of like he just decided i'm just going to outrun these guys and, and so sometimes when, when he's able to just let his physical ability like just the natural talents he has take over um he i mean i, I can't tell y'all watching him from week to week just how important he was for this south Carolina offense this past season that really didn't have a ton of other receiving threats on the field Wes, full disclosure, after we get past the unanimous consensus top six quarterbacks in this draft, the next guy at the top of my list is Spencer Rattler. I happen to like Mm -hmm. him, and I think of that next grouping, he is the one who looks the most pro-ready to me, has the most pro Mm -hmm. skills, and has the most potential upside to be one of the later guys picked who could wind up being a starter in this league. Now, I know the one thing that bothers me, and it rankles a lot of people, he's barely over six feet. So the stature is a legitimate red flag. Other than that, though, I really like a lot about what he brings to an NFL team. Share your thoughts, if you could, on him. Yeah, and and full disclosure on my end, I – you know, I've, I've gotten to know Spencer a little bit during his two years here in Columbia, and, and I, I just really like him as a kid and a person. And, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit biased towards him because I, I, once you get to know him, he, he's incredibly likable, great natural leader. I, I think all that stuff that was kind of out there floating around on the Internet after the Netflix special from ages ago, maybe kind of his reputation preceded him a little bit, and a lot of it just wasn't fair compared to, who he has become, I think, as he's matured as a person. And, yeah, you're right, the stature, that's something he'll never be able to change. So if a team is going to dock him for that, you know, I, there's nothing he can do about it. Higher cleats. Look- higher cleats, Wes. Tell him. Get higher cleats. <laughs> two-inch two inch cleats go. instead of the three-quarters. Two-inch. <laughs> Start uh, put, putting quarters in his shoes, I guess. But I, uh, well, that may I, I weigh him when- down too much. He won't be as mobile. I don't know if that'll work. <laughs> See, yeah, so, there, yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> But um, the, the arm talent, I mean, just the, the natural ability to throw the football, the, just the way it comes out of his hand, and, and even seeing him throw in person, he, like, like you said, like he, he's not a big guy, but the amount of velocity he can create on mm-hmm. a football at his size is uh, it, something you kind of have to see in person to, to really get the complete feel of it. And, um, you know, I think throughout his career he has kind of had to fight that a mentality of I can make every single throw that exists. I can fit this through any window that's out there. So that's something he and Dal Loggins, the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach here, really honed in on this last year is protecting the football, knowing when to take a risk, knowing when not to. And, um, you know, I, I think this is someone, if I'm an NFL team and I already kind of have my quarterback for right now, but I want to draft a guy who can be my backup, who can – kind of learn my system for a few years and then see what I have, but also could step in in a one- or two-game situation if there are injuries. I I mean, I watch the league, and I see some of the backups in this league, and then I watch Spencer throw up close here, and I'm like, this dude has has more natural talent than a lot of guys that I've seen make it in the league. So um, it's going to be all about just, um, like I said, continue to settle in and, and not turn the football over keep making progress in that area but 
I, uh, I tell you, I, I would bet on Spencer Rattler after being around him for a couple of seasons here. Well, and to your point, he's got a wealth of experience, which is always good coming into the NFL level, especially when we see some of these quarterbacks. Maybe they have a start for a year or two, but not necessarily as much as he had between Oklahoma as well as South Carolina. I want to jump to one of the guys that blocked for him who transferred from Yale. I got to know him by covering the Ivy League, Nick Gargiulo. He's got center guard flexibility from what he did at South Carolina, West. Then he played tackle and center at Yale. So, I mean, that clearly is appealing that he's walking into the NFL and he pretty much has lined up everywhere and he's athletic. But from what you saw at South Carolina based on who he went up against, where do you think his best ideal place is at the next level? I think once you start talking about, you know, the, the NFL size and athleticism, when you start talking about offensive tackle and, you know, and even guard, I, I think when you combine his body type uh, along with his intelligence, which, you you know, you would expect being a Yale guy, but, but even just sitting – I had a chance to do a kind of sit-down interview with him. Um, hilarious guy, great personality, and, and just you instantly are like, all right, this guy is way smarter than me. And so, um, you know, with, with Nick G, he, he uh, I, I think he fits as a center. Like, I, I think the amount that uh, a lot of times is going to be on a center just from a, an intellectual standpoint and having to know um, where, where everybody's going around you and, and kind of everything that goes into that position, to me, I, I would profile him definitely as a center. I, I'll be curious to see. I haven't heard anything lately on exactly where he projects in this draft, but – I think when you look at, like you said, the versatility at Yale, the fact that he now has a, a year in the SEC under his belt so they can see him match up with a little bit bigger, a little bit more athletic guys, um, I, I think he could be a steal for somebody. And he, he's someone you're never going to have to worry about off the field. You're not going to have to worry about any of the extracurriculars. Like He, he handles himself incredibly well, and it is just one of those locker room guys that everybody loves. Wes, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you about Little Turbo, uh, running back Dante Miller. The Giants just brought him in. Lance knows him from his four years at Columbia, but we know about the pit stop he had uh, with the Gamecocks. Mm -hmm. I see his skill set. I know at the pro day there was a clocking of 427. Seems like he'd be a perfect fit for the new kickoff return rule in the NFL. But I'd like your perspective from what you know of him, what you saw of him in practice. Uh, Is there more there? than just maybe being a kickoff return specialist in your estimation. Yeah, you know, and I you pull for Dante, having a chance to talk to him a little bit. I, I hope there is. I, I think the more likely scenario, just being honest, is, is probably in, in some type of kickoff return or punt return role. You know, he now at, at Columbia, he did – he put together a really nice career, a really nice yeah. resume at running back. We, we never really got to see that here. He was behind some other guys. Um the year before this past season, and then he was actually appealing to the NCAA to get another year of eligibility this past season, and it got denied. So we, we didn't get to see a ton from him here at South Carolina, but uh, the, the speed, man, it is I mean, it, it's off the charts. The numbers don't lie there. And, and again, not to be a broken record, but another guy that just, uh, when you talk to him, a phenomenal dude, has been through a ton in his personal life to get to where he is now, and um uh, He's not one, if he gets a real shot, he's not one that's going to take it for granted. You're going to get everything he's got and more, I think. Well, Wes, let me know if you need any more Ivy League guys to come down to Columbia because, you know, <laughs> hey, I have my fair down. share of connections, you know, and it's a very small agent fee, I promise. You can tell the guys down in South Carolina, I won't charge that much, but I'm with you. I mean, I saw Dante Miller. He was a four special teamer, a core guy. He played coverage and returned the ball. So I think if there's any place for him on the NFL level, I'm with you. I think he could definitely carve out a role, assuming, of course, he can make the 53-man roster. He is Wes Mitchell, covers South Carolina for Gamecock Central. Dot com. Wes, greatly appreciate the insight that you provided and look forward to talking down the road. Thanks for hopping on. Stay well. Yeah, thanks, guys. You have a good one. Send those Ivy League guys on down here, okay? Not a problem. <laughs> we will go straight down south to South Carolina. That is Wes Mitchell. We appreciate him jumping on here on Giants.com. Big Blue Kickoff Live. It's amazing. They had a Yale guy, they got a Columbia guy, and now all of a sudden <laughs> a connection here to the Giants. We've got one more stop on our journey across college football as we're going to head. Actually, we're not going to head anywhere. We're going to stay in the SEC. Yes. Because 
We've got Tennessee here on the horizon, as they also have a few different prospects at a variety of different positions, including a quarterback that is a physical specimen. Unfortunately, just the accuracy did not necessarily add up during his career. So we are going to be hearing from Brent Hubbs, who is one of Tennessee's radio analysts. But as you can tell, a wealth of talent that we have put so far under the microscope here because all of these teams, even though the volume's not high, they certainly have appeal in terms of the different areas that they can contribute. Well, this is what we're going to see in this year's draft. We're going yeah. to see four rounds of very intriguing players who uh, scouts can't wait to talk about. And then after that, it gets kind of thin. But up top, this is as good a draft of the first four rounds you're going to find. So let's bring in Brent Hubbs, Tennessee radio analyst, here with us on Giants.com. Brent, you got Lance Meadow and Paul Dettino. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Everything, every, <clears throat> everything is good. I, I, I think this is a fascinating draft ahead of what's going to be a really bizarre 25 draft because of how deep it's going to be with all the, the COVID guys at 25. Mm, yeah. But but I tell you, this 24 draft, offensive lineman at the top is pretty phenomenal. I think there's going to be more value in skill guys in the third and fourth round than maybe we've seen in the last few drafts, which makes this one, to me, a really interesting to get a real impact skill guy that late compared to maybe the last two or three drafts. Well, let's jump right into the skill position groups for Tennessee. And I want to start with Jalen Wright, the running back. I mean, it's amazing to me, Brent. He produced an explosive run on 25% of his carries, and that refers to a run for at wow. least 10-plus yards. So you look at that, you look at 7.4 yards per carry he averaged. That was second best in the FBS I mean, he clearly produced his fair share of highlights. But at the end of the day, is that a product of Brent, what he was surrounded with at Tennessee? Or is that more of a product of his skill set that you could throw him into any NFL team and you're still going to get that? How would you best assess that? Well, that's a great question. And, and for me, the biggest stat that jumps out is his yards after contact. Because because what you're wondering about Jalen Wright is, is he a home run hitter and that's kind of it? Or is he got a guy who can grind it a little bit, right? Can he can he get you the three or four hard yards you got to get? Because nobody's going for 70 on a regular basis in the National Football League. It just doesn't happen. Sure. Uh, and, and, and I think what Jalen did last year from a physicality standpoint appeals to scouts and NFL teams as much as the yards per carry – Top end speed and all that's important, but boy, I, I tell you, his yards after contact numbers last year were really impressive. You know, I want to ask you about the quarterback. I understand that there's more to say about Wright, but I'm going to go right to Joe Milton because okay. to me, well, here's the thing, Brent. He is one of the most intriguing guys in this draft because he has a howitzer for an arm. Okay, I don't think anyone's going to dispute he's got the strongest arm of all the quarterbacks in this class. And if you strictly love a guy's arm, you're going to want him somewhere in your camp. But everything else, he's just so raw. And and he's going to need two or three years, I think, sitting behind somebody on an NFL roster before he's going to be actually ready to play in the pro game. At least that's what I think, and I think a lot of people agree. I'd love to know what you think. You've seen him up close and personal on a day-to-day -day basis. But that arm strength is one thing that's going to attract a lot of people regardless of any of the warts. Well, there's no doubt. And, and seeing him up close based, you know, every day, I mean, that you pick all the scabs, right? And that's what, that's what the league does with quarterbacks in particular is you find every wart you can find on a prospect and, and break him down to, to basically he can't play, and then you try to build back up how much can he play. That's sort of the process. But, you know, for, first thing with Joe, Joe's a high-character guy who's going to be great in a locker room. Uh, so I think that's the first thing you start with with him. A great teammate. Um, he didn't jump back in the portal when he could have after Hendon Hooker took the job from him. He stayed the course and, and – and, you know, was a good teammate and worked and, and improved and, and all those types of things. The arm's fantastic. The whole question with Joe Milton is going to be the processing, and, and that is how quick does he make a decision, mm -hmm. how well does he read the field, how quick does he process everything that you have to process. And, and that's the hard part in Joe because Joe is one of those that, 
listen, routes versus air, one-on-ones, um, Joe's terrific. Is it as good seven-on-seven seven settings versus one-on-ones? You know, maybe you, the more clutter you get out there, the more questions that seem to pop up with Joe when you go beyond just the physical traits, which are very obvious. And I think that's what you have to decide as a coach, coordinator, GM, scouting director is what is this guy when it's on the line and, there's, and he's going against 11 guys? Listen, I know he can throw it 75 yards. I know it's a cannon. I know he's 6'5 and 250 pounds. Everything about that is beautiful. It's just how does that translate into playing the game, um, you know, against in 11-on-11 settings? And I think that's the unknown right now with Joe. I think that's what everybody is trying to figure out. Somebody will take a chance on him, probably a little higher than most thought originally. Um, but what do you get? I don't know. I think time's going to tell with Joe. It's interesting, Brent, listening to you break down Joe Milton. It reminds me of an analogy. If you bring a three-point specialist in in basketball, you watch him shoot around before the game, he hits everything. Then you put him out in a game, you give him a defender, and all of a sudden he's not knocking down his shots. It, it seems as if there's a little bit about that with Joe where – you watch him work one-on-one, -on -one, he'll hit everything, but then you see him in games, and this is the number to me that's most disturbing. He only completed 39% of his passes beyond 10 yards. So if the arm strength's there, but the accuracy's not, you wonder whether or not if a good quarterback coach could get his hands on him, even as Paul mentioned for a year or two, is that going to change when all of a sudden you put a defender or two in his vicinity? Well, and, and that's the million-dollar question. And, I mean, that's one of those where uh, – and, listen, we're asking similar questions about, like, Caleb Williams at the top, right? There are some people think when you turn on the tape with Caleb Williams, the tape's not nearly as pretty as all the other measurables and, you know, scripted out drills and scripted out throwing sessions and all of that is. Thanks, thanks Brent, by the way. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm not the only <laughs> one who sees I, it. I, I mean, I think that, that – but I think that's the hard part with quarterbacks. I really do. And, and I think part of that is because the quarterback development process, from the time kids are young, it's all about the seven-on-seven -seven game. It's all about you don't get pressured. It, it, it's all about reading one side of the field. You know, there's a lot of limitations put on young players at quarterback to get them on the field early. How developed are they when they're ready to go to the National Football League and there's all kinds of things thrown at them? Are they a system guy? Can they really play in any system? That's why the processing question is such a big question, I think. And I think that's the one that you're trying to find the answer to that is the hardest. That's why some guys get drafted high and they pan out and you go, wow. And then some guys get drafted there and it doesn't translate. And I think with Joe, he's not going to get drafted high. The question is, can you make it translate? Listen, there's a lot to like. It's, and somebody's going to think they can fix him. And maybe they can. We'll just – only time is going to tell. I think there's going to be value in him late because you're not going to have to spend a whole lot of money on him, and, and it could pan into turn into something. Or, or maybe it doesn't, and you're not really out a whole lot of skin in the game with it. Again, he's coachable. Um, he's a guy who likes to work. I think he likes the game. But there are red flags. I mean, look at his numbers throwing the ball across the middle. Mm -hmm. Tennessee got away from throwing the ball across the middle last year because they weren't comfortable with him doing that. It yeah. was everything to the outside. Those are things that as an NFL franchise you have to look at. Why? Can I fix it? You know, is it repairable? Where is he in his developmental phase? Where is he in terms of what the ceiling is for him beyond just having the rocket arm? All right, Kamal Haddon, uh, the corner, injured his shoulder, and I don't know if you have any information on how he is rehabbing and if that might impact where he goes, but – but certainly his skill set is, is high caliber. Well, he is, he is ahead of schedule. He's going to be fine for anything this summer, OTAs and, and that type of deal. He's going to be turned loose, I believe. Uh, and, and talking to Kamal, he feels like he's going to be cleared and ready to go, um, which is a good thing. His draft stock is hurt by the fact that nobody's got to work him out. No doubt. Um, but, but here's the thing. Kamal Haddon is a guy that when you look at him – from two years ago and look at him last year before he got hurt, dramatically different player. Guy who's clearly gained confidence, clearly comfortable, clearly 
comfortable in zone and in man and has gotten better. I think he has a really nice high ceiling. Is he going to be an all-conference player? I'm not saying that. He'll play teams, which is big. Um, he, he can do a lot of different things on special teams for you. And, and I think he's a guy who it really has learned to love the game from the standpoint of putting in the work beyond his athletic ability. And, and I think when you look at the history of Tennessee the secondary coach Willie Martinez, you can go back and look at some guys who were drafted or they were free agents who played a while in the National Football League. Justin Coleman was a guy who Willie Martinez had at Tennessee who spent 10 years in the National Football League. Basically, he was an undrafted guy who fit in as a nickel player. You know, uh, you look at Theo Jackson, who's with the Vikings now. Same scenario. So I think that that helps Kamal Haddon because if you do your research on the program that Kamal's coming out of and who coached him, you feel better about where that is because of his development and understanding of the game because there's a history of those guys under Willie Martinez who were late picks or undrafted guys who ended up making teams and having nice NFL careers. That probably helps Kamal Haddon get opportunities somewhere. Well, Brent, I'm going to circle back to where we started because I think Jalen Wright got shortchanged because of the intrigue <laughs> of Joe Milton's arm strength. When you know, right. we were talking up his explosiveness and you were talking about his ability to absorb contact, my question is, I think we saw when he gets to the outside, look out. What do you think of his potential as an inside runner and how he fared with respect to that facet? Well, I think his, I think his work as an inside runner took a huge step from two years ago to this past season. I think that he is playing with better pad leverage. He's playing with better, better physicality. He is finishing runs, falling forward. I had a unique opportunity with, with, with Jalen Wright and covering some recruiting stuff. I actually dealt with him when he was in high school in Durham, North Carolina. And when he was in high school and he came out his senior year, it was a COVID year. And in North Carolina, they did not play football at all. It was in the spring, and he was already graduated as a midterm enrollee. So he got no carries as a high school senior. He didn't play a senior year of football in high school. So he comes to Tennessee. He's light. He's got to add muscle and strength. Clearly, when you look at his physique, he has done that. The other thing that's intriguing about him is not only what he's done at Tennessee in terms of getting better, he has split time his entire career at Tennessee. So this is not a guy who's got a ton of tread on the tires. Okay, He's not a guy who's – but he averaged 28 carries a game, and they, they beat the crap out of him for three years in college, and you, you just wonder how much more is in the tank. He is a young running back in terms of how much mileage he's got on his body, which I think is, 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 is something that NFL teams, if they do a deep dive, which everybody in scouting does, will like about him. He was a track superstar in high school. He was a nationally ranked 60-meter guy. He was a out wide, get it to him in space, let him go to work. We kind of thought he would be one of those types of backs. But he really dove into the weight room and added weight, and he went from, you know, a buck 75 to 205, 210, and he runs with a lot more power. He's a good pass protector. I, I think there's a reason why people are talking about him as a potential first, second, third running back coming off the board because I do think there's a lot of value in him. He could be in the, he could be in the return game as a kick return guy, and we know that rule is changing. So yeah. what what are, what are kickoff return guys going to look like? Are they all going to be just slot wiggle guys, or is it going to be a guy with some power and you put some uh, speed running back type guy back there? He could be intriguing in that role as well, which only adds to his value. I, I, I'm 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 a little bit bullish on him. I'm a, I'm. I'm pretty high on Jalen because I see I've seen how far he has come in his career at Tennessee. He is a much more complete player now than I ever thought he would be coming out of high school. See, that's why I asked the follow up, and now I could sleep well at night because I think we did Jalen Wright justice. So, see, there was a reason why we came full circle here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. He is. Brent Hubbs, Tennessee radio analyst. Brent, can't thank you enough. Really appreciate all the great time and insight that you spent here with us and look forward to talking down the road. Thanks, Brent. Any, anytime, guys. Give me a holler. Thank you. You got it. Our pleasure. So that wraps up our lengthy journey across the territory of Division One college football. 
as I don't think we left any stone unturned. However, there is some extra business to get to before we wrap up this program. That's a few reminders. Giants Huddle Podcast, you can check that out on your favorite podcast platform. You can also go to Giants.com slash podcast. As we approach the 2024 campaign, you can take your fandom to the next level. Season ticket membership, stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships now available for the 2024 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, you can visit Giants.com slash ticket. Its limited inventory is available and the Giants official connected TV streaming app Giants TV it brings you original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans Giants TV it's free it's on Apple TV Roku Amazon Fire TV and the Giants mobile app this program's free too there you go see <laughs> everything is tied in and connected in all seriousness though before we wrap up you know, we didn't get an opportunity to maybe give a thought or two about maybe one or two players that particularly stands out to us on everybody that we talked about. I know you're very high on Spencer Rattler, so you well, I just well think documented he, that. I, I think again, if you're looking at the projects uh, in the quarterback room, yeah, you know, if the Giants decide that they want to get somebody in the later rounds to work under the current quarterbacks that they have, Rattler would be a really good choice for me. And I appreciate the stature thing. I'm usually one who wants the bigger frame guys. I get the stature problem with Rattler, but there's so much to like. Uh, to be frank, and I was never a Baker Mayfield guy, but man, did he prove me wrong with Tampa Bay this year. Turned it around. Well, it's the environment, up, until, up until then, he was a very inconsistent, up and down kind of quarterback who I was not a fan of. I thought that's what he was going to be. And then this year, he turned out to be really good. Rattler is an awful lot like Baker Mayfield. Well, and I'm going to stay in the South Carolina wheelhouse. I like Leggett because as we were mm -hmm. talking with Wes Mitchell about, I just think there's so much more meat to bite off on that bone yeah. because they barely tapped into it. Sure. He was talking about the highlight reel plays that he put together where he was running past an entire defense. It's there. I think you're getting that nice piece of clay that you could still mold into an explosive playmaker because I also don't think the good news is I don't think South Carolina wore him down because, A, he didn't get a lot of right. targets prior to this past season, and he didn't get opportunities. So that alone, to me, makes him perhaps a special talent that if you don't get one of the top wide receivers, you wait you could very well get a steal in this It's draft. a deep receiver class. Yeah. That's why you're going to be getting quality guys in the third round. It's going to happen. Absolutely. All right, so that's just a little bit of a tidbit from us in terms of all the players that we have digested on this program. And today's episode of Big Blue Kickoff Live. It's part of the Giants platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcasts. For Paul Dottino, I'm Lance Meadows. Stay locked to Giants.com for all the latest. We'll be back up and running again on Friday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. We will speak to you then. Have a good one.